We will be spending a bit of time today with the famous hadith of Ukasha. Ukasha ibn Mihsan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a companion, a famous companion who was part of a famous hadith that would be later known as the hadith of Ukasha where he would hear the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam speaking about a group of Muslims, 70,000 of them on the day of judgment who will be given special treatment on the day of Qiyamah and whilst everybody else is suffering they will be given a backdoor entrance into Jannah so Ukasha he would stand up and say O Messenger of Allah ask Allah to make me one of them and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam would say you are one of them. The hadith begins with Husayn ibn Abdul Rahman saying the following I was sat with Sa'id ibn Jubair in a gathering. Sa'id is a tabi'i, a second generation Muslim. Sa'id ibn Jubair was the teacher of Husayn ibn Abdul Rahman. Husayn says we were sat with Sa'id. Then Sa'id said to us, Who saw the shooting star last night? And Hussain said, Ana. So he is saying to everybody there that I saw the shooting star, but it wasn't because I was praying at night. You may think that I saw the shooting star late at that hour of night because I was praying Qiyam, night prayer. I wasn't doing that. The reason why I was awake was because I was stung. And here he is sending a very powerful message to everybody who will hear his words that we are to be a people who cover our good deeds the same way we cover our sins. Don't think, don't praise me for a matter that I wasn't engaged in. I wasn't praying, I was stung. That's, it was the pain of the sting that kept me up at night. They were aware that ujb, admiration of your good deeds may cause it to collapse. So they were sincere people and they would hide their deeds and they were very, very honest with themselves as well. Do you worry about this? If you worry about this, my brothers and my sisters, I give you a very accurate litmus test. A benchmark which you can use to measure how sincere you truly are in terms of your actions. Ibn Asakir, he narrates on the authority of Hudayfa, the companion who was given by the Prophet Sallallahu the names of all of the hypocrites of Medina. Only Hudayfa. Hudayfa, he was given the secret information. So a man, he comes to Hudayfa and he said to him, Ya Hudayfa, hal ana min al munafiqeen? Am I a hypocrite? He said to him, Do you pray when you are alone? And do you ask Allah Almighty to forgive you when you commit a sin? He said, Yeah, I do. So Hudayfa said to him, He said, Go. Because Alhamdulillah, Allah has not made you one of the hypocrites. So look at one of the conditions he gave him. Do you pray when you are alone? This is what I mean, my brothers and sisters, by the litmus test that I must use and yourself if we want to measure how sincere we actually are. Is our iman real and genuine or is it dependent upon the praise of other people? What percentage of your good deeds are in privacy? Hussain ibn Abdul Rahman says, I saw the shooting star, but it wasn't because I was in salah. It's because I was stung. That's what kept me up. Don't think good of me. His teacher Sa'id ibn Jubayr says to him, فَمَاذَا صَنَعْتْ What did you do? He says, ارتقيت. I did ruqya upon myself. Ruqya, as you know, is when you recite Qur'an or other prophetic dua or ayat upon yourself or upon another individual who is ailing or is not ailing. He said, why did you do ruqya upon yourself when you were stung? He said, because of a hadith that I heard a shabi narrated to us. He said to him, what did a shabi Amir ibn Sharahbil al Hamadani. What did Al Shabi narrate? He said he narrated a hadith on the authority of Buraida ibn Husayb al Aslami. He said the companion Buraida narrated and said there is no ruqya except for the evil eye or a poisonous sting. In other words, as the scholars they say, the most effective ruqya that you can do is when the illness is because of evil eye or the illness is because of a poisonous insect or scorpion sting. So he's saying to him, this is why I did ruqya, because I have dalil, I have evidence from the sunnah. 
So Sa'id ibn Jubair was happy to hear this. And he said to him, he says, the one who stops at what he heard is successful. Meaning, the one who acts upon the knowledge that he has and doesn't add, this person is successful and he has done well. Sa'id is saying to Hussain, I'm going to tell you another hadith with regards to Ruqya. You've just quoted one. I'm going to tell you another hadith. But before I do, I praise you. I praise you because you acted with ilm, with knowledge, with dalil, with understanding. He said, however, I will tell you another hadith with regards to Ruqya. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the nations of the world were presented to me. From the time of Adam alayhi salam till the last human being to walk the earth, he said, I saw them all on a plain of land. Some of the scholars says this was in a dream, which is revelation, and others have said this was during the night journey, and there are other opinions as well. He said, I saw prophets standing, and their followers were less than ten. Imagine Allah Almighty sending a prophet to a community, to an ummah, who is aided with hujjah, proof, and ayat, signs, and wahi, revelation, and only three, four, five people believe in him. He walks into Jannah with his ummah and the rest of his community are driven into Jahannam. He said, I saw other prophets who had with them only one or two people. And I saw prophets who were standing all by themselves. Not a single person from their ummah accepted their dawah. So Yawm Al-Qiyamah, this messenger, would walk into Jannah and the rest of his community, they are all taken into oblivion. And now our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is looking around, wanting to see his ummah. How many people will follow me? And he would finally see his ummah. And then he said, suddenly I saw huge multitudes of people. And I thought this was my ummah. Uh, this is Prophet Musa and his people, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is an honoring of the Prophet of Allah, Musa. Huge gatherings believed and accepted his message. But where are my people? He says, I looked and I was told to stare into the horizon and I saw huge crowds of people having filled the horizon. And then I was told, look into the other horizon. And I looked and I saw multitudes of people having filled that horizon as well. He was impressed, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then it was said to him, this is your nation. This is your nation. But it doesn't stop there. He is then told, and with them, there will be 70,000 Muslims. Ya Rabbi, make us amongst them. 70,000 Muslims who will be made to enter Jannah without any prior suffering or accountability. So everything you have heard and read, with regards to the terror and horror of Yawm al the day of standing, the day of accountability, as people wait, sweating and suffering and going gray, as other people stand in trepidation, waiting for their name to be called out, to stand in front of Al-Jabbar, the compeller Allah, there will be a group of people who will be given special treatment and they will be given backdoor access into Jannah. Their faces will be glowing like the moon. Isn't this a small number, however? Because our ummah, is a blessed ummah. The ummah today is in its billions. And 70,000 is equivalent to any small village. Your messenger alayhi salatu wasalam thought of this before you and I. He says, as Ahmad narrates in his musnad, I asked Allah for more. And he gave me. What did he give him? He says, with every 1,000, Allah has given me another 70,000. Allahu Akbar. So that is 4,900,000. But the hadith doesn't stop there. And the next part of the hadith I can only translate, but I cannot explain. As Imam Tirmidhi narrates in his Sunan and at Tabarani in his Mu'jam, that he said, with every 1,000, another 70,000, in addition to that, three handfuls from the handfuls of my Lord. We don't understand this, but we know it is great. Thus Umar radiallahu anhu, when he heard this, he said, Allahu Akbar. Qais, one of the narrators of this hadith, when hearing this, he took him by his clothes and he said to him, did you honestly hear this from the Prophet ﷺ? He said, I heard it from him and my heart fully comprehended it as well. Allahu Akbar. Then our messenger ﷺ got up. He says the Prophet ﷺ got up without any further elaboration and entered his house. 
So the companions, they began to speak. Who would enter Jannah without accountability? Some of the Sahaba said, maybe they are the ones who accompanied the Prophet ﷺ. Maybe it's them. Others, they said, no, we think it's the ones who were born into Islam and they never had associated a partner with Allah. And they mentioned other opinions. Then the Messenger ﷺ came out. What are you discussing? They said, we're trying to find out who these 70,000 blessed people are. And then he gives the, the answer. He says, these 70,000 plus people, they are a people who, number one, they don't ask for ruqya. Sa'id ibn Jubayr says, I'm going to give you another hadith about ruqya. This is why he mentioned this hadith. They are a people who, they do not ask for ruqya. Number two, they don't brand themselves with fire. Number three, they don't follow bad omens. And number four, they put their reliance solely upon Allah. They don't ask for somebody to recite ruqya upon them. But they, their reliance upon Allah is so great that they will only ask for ruqya from the Creator Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. This also shouldn't be misunderstood that if somebody offers you ruqya without you asking, it doesn't mean that you should reject it. And it is also recommended that you offer ruqya to those who are ill. Don't wait for them and don't pressure them to ask of you. They may need it, but they don't want to ask. Also, they don't brand themselves with fire. This is a form of treatment called cauterization today. Our Messenger وسلم, permitted it, but he disliked it tremendously because of the pain involved. Number three, they don't follow any bad omens. So they don't see any number as unlucky, or a place as unlucky, or a time as unlucky. Their reliance is upon Allah. And then the Messenger وسلم, summarizes and says, they are a people who put their trust in Allah. This is when Ukashat ibn Muhsan radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood up. He was amazed. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, ask Allah to make me one of them. He said, Anta minhum. You are one of them. A second companion gets up. O Messenger of Allah, ask Allah to make me one of them as well. He said to him, Ukashat has beaten you to it. Although the companions are the worthiest of people for these places, but this is to open up for us the avenues of hope that we also have an opportunity to be amongst these 70,000 plus people as well. When you read the hadith at first hand, it seems as if Ukasha got this place in paradise through chance. He happened to be the first person to react and he said, ask Allah to make me one of them and then he got it. La wallahi, it was not by luck. If you take a cursory glance at the seerah, the biography of Ukasha radiallahu anhu, you will find that this was not chance. Because Ukasha radiallahu anhu is a name of a companion who had been working tirelessly pursuing the home of the hereafter for a very, very long time. And this, when this came, he claimed his place in Jannah that was already his. Ukasha ibn Muhsan radiallahu anhu, my brothers and sisters, is the name of a companion who was one of the first, one of the earliest of people to embrace the religion of Islam. As Ibn Sa'd narrates in his tabaqat, he took part in the battle of Badr. He took part in the battle of Uhud and the battle of Khandaq. And Ibn Sa'd, he says, Ukasha took part in every single ghazwa with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Safi al-Rahman Mubarak Thuri in his book, Al-Rahiq al maktoum mentions that on the day of Badr, Ukasha was fighting with so much courage and bravery and seriousness that his, his sword snapped in half. Radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet sallallahu gave him a stick. He said, here, fight with the stick. But before he gave him the stick, the Prophet sallallahu shook the stick and it became a sword. And he would fight with it till Allah Almighty would give victory to the believers and Ukasha would hold tightly onto the sword and it would be named al awn meaning the one that gives assistance and it would stay with Ukasha all the way until he would be May Allah be pleased with him. During the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when he was fighting the apostates who refused to give zakah when the Prophet sallallahu passed away. Ukasha took part in the battles against them and he would be by Tulayha al-Asdi as Ibn Hajar narrates in his book Al-Isabah and Umar ibn al-Khattab would say to Tulayha after Tulayha embraced Islam how can I love you when you have such righteous people what did Tulayha say? he said Allah Almighty honored them too through me and Allah didn't humiliate me through them do you understand this? he honored them and he gave them, mocked them through me but alhamdulillah that Allah didn't disgrace me by allowing these righteous men to see me when I was still a pagan.
This is Ukash ibn Muhsan. Ukash had been working very, very hard trying to get to Allah Almighty and His pleasure. Therefore, when the Prophet ﷺ said that there will be 70,000 who will enter Jannah without punishment and without accountability, Allah Almighty was the one who inspired Ukasha to say, make me one of them. Ask Allah to make me one of them, O Messenger of Allah. And then Angel Jibreel would descend from the heavens and tell the Prophet ﷺ in a split second, tell Ukasha that he's one of them. Do you see the bigger picture now? This wasn't an accident. This is just the outcome of what he had been working on for a very long time. Okasha has now beaten me.